Do you constantly find yourself fighting with your partner and sabotaging your relationship and not knowing why or how to stop? If you're like many people, you may not realize that your attachment style could be the root of the problem. In fact, attachment theory suggests that our early relationships with caregivers can have a significant impact on our adult relationships. If you want to break the cycle of toxic and sabotaging behaviors in your romantic relationships, then keep watching and find out how to break the patterns that keep you stuck in these destructive cycles so you can find the love and happiness that you deserve. Have you ever been in a situation where you feel like your relationships just aren't quite working out? Maybe you feel like you're always pushing people away, or perhaps you're running away, or you feel like you cling too tight to people, or maybe you feel like you just aren't getting the love and support from that special person in your life. If any of these circumstances sound familiar, then chances are you might benefit from learning more about attachment styles. These are patterns of behavior that we develop in relationships based on our experiences with caregivers who are typically our parents when we were growing up. However, before anybody starts blaming relationship problems on parents, it's important to note that attachment styles formed during early childhood are not necessarily identical to those demonstrated in adult romantic attachments. A great deal of time has elapsed between infancy and adulthood so intervening experiences you may have had with the ex, for instance, also play a large role in adult attachment styles. The point is, understanding your attachment style can be the key to unlocking more fulfilling, meaningful relationships that can stand the test of time. And I'm going to look at four different attachment styles, how they show up in romantic relationships and what steps you can take towards deeper, more meaningful connections and experience the closeness and intimacy in your relationship. Hi, I'm Lai, life coach, hypnotherapist and psychotherapist. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you may consider subscribing by clicking the bell so you can be notified when I post new videos. And thank you. I'm always grateful to have you here. Our romantic relationships are the most challenging aspects of our lives. And by recognizing the signs of each attachment style, we can learn to communicate effectively, manage conflict and foster healthier relationships. With the right tools and knowledge, we can build stronger, more fulfilling connections with our partners. So I invite you to explore the world of attachment styles with me. Together we'll dive into the characteristics and behaviors associated with each style. And we'll learn strategies that you can apply to help you create a safe, and supportive environment for yourself and your partner. However, please keep in mind, this can be applied to other relationships that you have in your life. Now, the four attachment styles are anxious, avoidant, disorganized, also known as fearful avoidant, and secure. As we delve deeper into each attachment style, I invite you to be curious, be open to what you hear and tune into what you could be experiencing because awareness is the first step to creating a more secure relationship. You may want to write down and take notes for your own self-reflection and the steps that you can take to build a better relationship with your partner. Let's start with anxious attachment, where the partner often experiences excessive worry and insecurity, feeling like they're not enough for their partner. They fear their partner will reject or abandon them they rely on others for their emotional needs and to resolve their problems. They struggle with being alone or single. They may feel like they need a partner to feel complete. They sacrifice their own needs and desires and hyper-focus on their partners for the sake of the relationship and they have low self-esteem and as I mentioned, they feel insecure. They don't have a healthy differentiation and often feel overwhelmed by their partner's emotions and pain. They often have this idealization that their partners can do no wrong until suddenly maybe they get anxiously activated and then their partner can do no right. Do any of these traits resonate with you? 
And if so, then you might experience the anxious attachment style. Let's meet anxious Alex, who says things like, my partner won't get as emotionally close as I would like. My partner doesn't really care about my problems. I struggle to forgive my partner when they let me down. I'm always worried that my partner doesn't love me. I'm fearful my partner will leave me. Whatever my partner feels, I have to also feel that thing. I often feel bad about myself for feeling. My partner is my other half and I feel incomplete without them. This is codependency. And then they say something like, it's always my fault and I need to fix things. An anxious attachment style typically involves an unconscious negative belief that they are unworthy of love and that their needs are unlikely to be met by others. This feeds insecurity, fear of abandonment or rejection, which can lead to clingy, needy behaviours in relationships. These beliefs, typically formed in childhood as a result of inconsistent or neglectant parenting, where the child did not receive enough emotional validation and support. And this negative self-perception can also trigger anxiety, worry and self-doubt. So what can Alex do? One, work on self-awareness to understand your thoughts and emotions. Ask yourself, what would happen if I let go a little bit and let this unfold on a timeline out of my control? What is the rush? Is there a fear or a wound driving me? Am I operating out of mistrust? Observe the narrative of the stories. This will go a long way to making it easier to communicate with your partner, which helps with the next one. And that is as you learn to identify and express your needs, it will help you feel seen and heard by your partner as you meet your own needs. The third one is to prioritize self-care, and that includes physical exercise, eating healthy, quality sleep, and perhaps look to clear unresourceful habits and addictions. The fourth one is self-reflect if you are overreading your partner, the non-verbals, the tone of voice. Do you interpret everything as a threat? Identify how it's not serving you and seek to clarify with your partner what is really happening. The next one is to challenge negative thoughts and replace them with a positive affirmation. Practice mindfulness. Take a breath, take a break and pause to calm down and reset. Practice gratitude for the positives in your partner and the relationship. The next one is to lean on positive support systems from family, friends and professional help, particularly if you experience strong emotional responses so that you can learn and implement strategies to calm your nervous system. The next one is to show self-compassion and honour the parts of yourself that is nurturing, loving and that you are mindful of your partner. Just ensure that your boundaries don't overcare for your partner. And the last one is to look to see if you are engaging with any protest behaviours when you feel disconnected from your partner. And these can be excessive communication via texting, calling, game playing, keeping score, threatening to leave, making your partner jealous, any manipulative behaviours where you are trying to get your partner to respond and soothe your sympathetic system. If you recognise any of these behaviours, be conscious and self-aware to avoid making presumptions, at least negative and pessimistic ones relating to your relationship. Openly let your partner know your needs rather than engage in these behaviours. By implementing these strategies, a partner with anxious attachment can work towards developing healthier, more secure patterns of attachment. Remember, change doesn't happen overnight, but with consistent practice, you can develop new habits that will positively impact your relationship with yourself and your partner. Let's look at the next one, which is avoidant attachment or dismissive avoidant types, which typically are known as commitment phobes who rationalize their way out of any intimate situation. They often express feeling crowded or suffocated when people try to get too close to them, so they push them away. They tend to be paranoid that others want to control them or box them in. They have a fear of being controlled, which often leads them to avoid honest communication and intimacy in relationships. 
they are almost always the one willing to leave the relationship. It's as though they have one foot out to always protect themselves as they have a challenging time expressing what they are feeling. This could be why when their partner is experiencing a strong emotional response, they want to get out of there, which is an unconscious process, that flight response, the opposite to an anxious pattern, which is I need to get in there. You may recognize this type as very independent and self-sufficient because they would often have been rewarded as a child for this behavior. However, they learned to self-soothe through external behaviors and as adults indulge in things like gaming, smoking, drinking, porn, and what happens is they are left to do a lot of the internal processing alone. As a child, they may not have had a lot of physical soothing and cuddling from parents as they were more rigid and inflexible with their parenting. Very authoritarian parenting encourages the child to be super independent and self-sufficient at a very early age. So that's how it becomes safe for them to be alone. However, they can end up bottling things up inside, keeping all of these emotions stored in their body outside of their conscious awareness and wear it like a superficial mask that gets unconsciously placed over their emotional experiences. And that can explain why they cannot connect to their emotions and feelings. Let's meet avoided Asher, who's more a thinker than a feeler, who has more of an idealized assessment of their caregiver and romantic partners. They can often dissociate from what is really going on because they sense the need to distance themselves from feeling afraid that they will lose themselves if they get too close. Asher says things like, I can't handle it when my partner is emotional. Why can't they just be rational like me? It's hard for me to find something within myself that can help me understand what you're feeling. I can take care of myself better than anyone else. I don't need help. And this is counter dependency. I prefer to keep to myself when I'm around my partner. That's what I had to do as a child. I don't talk to my partner about my feelings. I don't give my partner the opportunity to let me down. I don't allow my partner to be around me when I'm stressed or upset. Why talk it out when I could just go away and make myself feel better on my own? And I wouldn't care if my partner left me. I don't need anyone. People with avoidant attachment style may develop an unconscious belief that they don't need others to fulfill their emotional needs. They may appear independent and self-sufficient, but deep down, they may feel a sense of loneliness and a fear of rejection. They may also develop an unconscious belief that others are unreliable or untrustworthy. This belief can be a way to protect themselves from getting hurt or disappointed by their partner. They believe showing emotion is a sign of weakness, so they suppress their emotions, which can lead to a lack of emotional intimacy in relationships. These unconscious negative beliefs can lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy in which people with avoidant attachment style may struggle to form deep and meaningful relationships, which reinforces their beliefs that they don't need others or that others are unreliable. So what can Asher do? The first one is to embrace vulnerability, express your emotions to help promote emotional growth, increase intimacy and create a sense of trust in your relationship. The second one is to learn to get out of the thoughts and connect to the sensations and feelings in the body to learn how to connect and express emotions, which will also help you to understand and validate what your partner is experiencing. Number three, check in with how unrealistic or if you're idolizing your partner. And instead, ground yourself by prioritizing your relationship with quality time together, engage in shared activities and pillow talk to build a deeper connection and closeness, making it a safe place. Number four, often you're quick to identify negative traits of others. So instead, self-reflect and be curious and acknowledge your own emotions, how they feel in the body. And meditation is a wonderful practice to help connect to the emotional center of your own body signals. Number five, be patient and show compassion with yourself as you learn to protect the self while feeling safe to open up and express emotions as you integrate connection and reciprocity with your partner. Number six, know that it's okay to be vulnerable enough to ask for help and know what it feels like 
to need another person. Number seven, learn to identify when you're deactivating to keep yourself safe. And this might look like saying you're committed, but you're not really committing. Focusing on all the little things that your partner does wrong. Pushing your partner away and not being available. These types of behaviours self-sabotage intimacy. Number eight, try therapy, where you're actually building a reciprocal healthy relationship with your therapist that will not only support you and create the positive changes that you want and your healing in your life, but you'll also be able to transfer the relationship skills that you learn with your therapist, with your partner and out into the world. The third one is disorganized attachment, where the partner is afraid of intimacy and commitment and they may push others away and then feel lonely and rejected. They are less likely to express emotions, preferring to suppress them until they have an intense emotional outburst. They distrust and lash out emotionally at those who try to get too close to them. They struggle with boundaries and often feel overwhelmed or suffocated and can become defensive and resistant to emotional closeness. This is often where unresolved trauma is most common and what can often be at the core of this attachment style is inconsistent caregiving where the source of fear is also the source of safety, where one day it's loving and the next day it's wounding. So this looks like a parent who is frightening, aggressive, there is a strained, often unpredictable connection and often this can be because they are in their own traumatised world that spills out. Let's meet disorganised Drew, who says things like, one minute I'm okay and the next I'm in a panic and my partner is rejecting me. I want to get emotionally close to my partner, but I fear they will hurt my feelings. I want to feel close to my partner, but I don't trust them to want to be close to me. And I can't live without my partner, even though being with them isn't working. An unconscious negative belief that can be associated with the disorganized attachment style is the belief that I am unworthy or unimportant. If you experience a disorganized attachment style, you may also struggle with feelings of fear and mistrust towards your partner, as well as difficulty regulating emotions and coping with stress. These negative beliefs and patterns can lead to challenges in forming and maintaining a healthy, secure relationship. So what can Drew do? Number one, develop emotional regulation skills. In other words, think before you act. Practice mindfulness meditation and deep breathing exercises, which are all helpful in developing emotional regulation skills. Number two, use effective communication, which is crucial. Think about what your needs are and how best to express them to your partner. Number three, learn how to trust yourself so that you can remove yourself from toxic situations and stand up for yourself and protect your own boundaries. Four, be mindful of oversharing, slowly build connections, be aware if you're over controlling and instead learn to manage by planning and responding in life. This will allow you to recognize your triggers so that you can ground yourself and self-regulate. Number five, try therapy to learn how to identify and attract healthy partners, uncover your subconscious programming to explore the attachment history, where and who it was adopted from, and work on healing past trauma, which will enable you to develop healthier patterns of behavior for a more fulfilling relationship. The last one is the secure attachment. And this is the partner who is comfortable with expressing their thoughts, feelings and showing affection. They're comfortable being alone and independent, whether in or out of a romantic relationship. They display a healthy level of self-confidence and self-esteem. They can compromise, communicate and demonstrate their love in a healthy, natural way. They do not have to hide or give up part of their sense of self. They understand the importance of self-care, growth and self-reflection which allows them to self-regulate. They have a clear understanding of which relationships are worth prioritizing and invest in them accordingly. They have a great deal of empathy for their partner but don't feel overwhelmed by that empathy. They are quite good at collaborating with their partner to set meaningful goals in their relationship. They can talk to their partner about their emotional experiences 
they don't take their partner's moods personally because they aren't triggered by them and instead they can adapt to what is happening and better understand what their partner could be experiencing. The securely attached person generally had a pretty good experience in containment from their caregiver, which means their caregiver was able to respond to their pain and mirror back their pain to them, but not get overwhelmed by it themselves. So most securely attached individuals had early experiences with caregivers who were able to sit with them through their pain and really show support giving them a safe space to process the emotions without getting triggered themselves by the fact that someone they loved was in pain. They are able to tune into their emotional self and figure out who they are, what speaks to them in life and what they want to pursue to give them the best, most cohesive experience in life. Let's meet Secure Sam, who says things like, I find it easy to get emotionally close to my partner. When I show my feelings for my partner, I know that they feel the same about me. I feel supported and know that my partner will be there when I need them. And this is interdependence or dependent on each other in healthy ways. I want to have my partner with me when I'm upset. I'm not concerned about my partner leaving me. I feel I am seen, heard and understood by my partner. When my partner is upset or stressed, I'm not triggered by it because I can adapt my approach and talk openly to them to work through it. I can be respectful, fair, with a balanced view. If we have conflict, it can be uncomfortable, but it's not the end of the world. The unconscious positive belief of the secure attachment style is the deeply ingrained conviction that one is worthy of love and support. This belief formed during infancy and early childhood through the consistent and sensitive care of primary caregivers, which creates a sense of safety and trust in close relationships. They feel comfortable seeking and giving emotional support, and they're able to maintain healthy boundaries and express their needs and emotions effectively. On an unconscious level, if you have a secure attachment, you do not consciously think about feeling worthy because it feels natural and is an inherent part of who you are. This belief serves as a foundation for secure attachment, but let's see what else can Sam do. Number one, keep actively working on your relationship with yourself to maintain self-regulation. Two, keep yourself aware and safe and maintain your boundaries and remove yourself from toxic or counterproductive relationships. Three, continue to healthily observe and express your needs and emotions. Four, maintain some level of independence in a relationship. Number five, understand your partner's attachment style to better communicate and support them. Number six, build trust by being reliable, dependable and honest as you follow through on commitments. And number seven, listen attentively to your partner and acknowledge their feelings and perspectives. Number eight, Model the healthy sense of differentiation if your partner is in a bad mood by checking in with your partner, acknowledging that they are in a mood and ask, is there anything I can do? How can I support you? Remembering what you are and are not responsible for. These behaviours will grow confidence in you and your partner's capacity to love and care for each other and to feel emotionally safe in the relationship where it is easier to navigate complex emotional situations in a constructive and positive way. I trust that you may now understand why striving for secure attachments in your relationship is crucial. It's the key to cultivating a connection that's strong, trusting and long lasting. And the effort you put into achieving this kind of bond will pay off in countless ways. Think about it, when you feel secure in your relationship, everything feels easier. Communication flows more freely, misunderstandings are resolved with compassion instead of defensiveness, and you're both able to express your needs and desires without fear of judgment, abandonment, and rejection. Secure attachments also create an environment in which intimacy thrives. When you feel safe and accepted, you're more likely to let down your guard and be vulnerable with your partner. And this can lead to deeper emotional connections. 
more trust and a more satisfying physical relationship. In short, striving for secure attachments is a worthy investment of your time and energy. It requires a combination of self-awareness, empathy and commitment, but the result is a relationship that's built to withstand the ups and downs of life. I hope I've been able to give you helpful insights so that you can identify areas of growth and work towards building a stronger, secure connection with your partner. It's never easy to examine our own emotions and behaviours, but by exploring your attachment style, you may have gained a deeper understanding of why you tend to react or behave in certain ways in relationships. It's easy to blame our upbringing and our parents or caregivers for the way that we attach to others, but we must also acknowledge the fact that as adults, we have the responsibility and the power to choose how we respond and interact with others. If you're struggling with past trauma or negative parental programming, it can be important to seek deeper healing work to address and resolve these issues. So please consider seeking a trained therapist, counsellor or coach who specialises in trauma recovery or clearing parental programming. These professionals can help you explore your past experiences identify underlying subconscious programming, release negative emotions and thought patterns, and heal the deep-seated wounds that may be holding you back. It's important to remember that change takes time and effort, but it is possible. With patience, self-reflection, and the desire to learn from and let go of the past, we can create healthier and more fulfilling relationships in the present and future. The beauty of genuinely loving someone stems from the willingness to explore their world, to be vulnerable and to learn more about them every day. It requires curiosity, openness and a commitment to understand and connect with your partner on a deeper level and experience a fulfilling and happy partnership and a lifetime of love.